Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to ARA's Webinar Wednesday program for February 2023. I'm Jerry DiMaggio. I'll be serving as your moderator for today's webinar entitled Tracking and Bonding Performance of Commonly Used Tech Coat Materials and Asphalt Pavements. Now I'd like to introduce our, pre our presenter and my colleague, Dr. Abu Safin. Now, Dr. Safin is a staff civil engineer at ARA's Transportation and Infrastructure Division, and he works in the Research and Technology Deployment Group. Prior to joining ARA, he served as a postdoctoral fellow at the National Institute for Advanced Transportation Technology at the University of Idaho. He received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. For over the past seven years, Abu has assisted, managed, and participated as a researcher, an analyst, scientific developer, and instructor in a wide variety of projects that include experimental design, data collection and analysis, field sample collection, condition surveys, specification development, analytical and statistical modeling. Quite busy. He's the author of more than 20 technical papers and reports, all related to pavement materials, pavement design, and maintenance and non-destructive evaluation. Now, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to my good colleague, Abu. Uh, thank you so much, Jerry. I hope you can hear me loud and well. Uh, so uh, I want to welcome everyone again. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening based on the uh, time zone you are attending this webinar. So I'm showing you at first the outline of my webinar today. At first, I will start with a brief background of the subject matter. Uh, then I will show you the problem statement that arises the necessity of this research. The hypothesis uh, on that my research was built in. The objectives or research methodologies I followed for this research. This whole webinar is broadly divided into like two parts. At first part, I will show you uh, the, uh, the factors that, I, that affect the tracking of tech code. And the second part, uh, I'll discuss the factors that affect the bond strength of lab and field samples. And then I'll finish with conclusion and some recommendations. Uh, okay, so what is a tech code? So in a uh, simple word, it's a glue. It's a glue uh, that uh, joins different layers of, of, of asphalt pavement. So uh, I think uh, uh, some of us know that asphalt pavements are constructed in different uh, lifts or layers. So whatever it is, if it's a new construction or say reconstruction, if you uh, place a new layer over an old layer of an asphalt pavement, like if you place a surface course over a binder course, if you can follow my red cursor, you have to put a tack coat in the interface of your two layers so that your or as the pavement acts as a strong single monolithic layer. Uh, in the right side of the screen, you can see uh, this are, uh, is a picture of an, a spreader that is spreading tack coats, uh, and, uh, and after that, a paver will come, and they will spread a new layer of, of asphalt pavement, and this tack coat in the interface will act as a glue that will hold two layers together. Okay, so now we all know what tack coat is. Let's discuss what some common problem that uh, the users of tack coat face with using tack coat. At first is the tracking of tech code. So tracking of tech code means a picking up of tech code by construction vehicle tires. So what happens if there is tracking? So if there is tracking, there will not be enough tech code present in the interface of your two layers. So there will be insufficient bonding because of the lack of a proper tech code that will lead to slippage failure, and that will ultimately lead to fatigue cracking. Okay, so this slide will uh, make your concept of tracking more clear, I think. If you can uh, follow this picture in the middle of the screen, you can see a uh, truck is moving on after applying tech code, and this tech code didn't properly state or break down. So you can see it's picking up, uh, the tire is picking up the tech code. And if you can zoom, if we can zoom in, the, see the zoom in, in view of this picture, you can see uh, uh, that tire picked up the tech code, so there is uh, not enough tech code present in this uh, pavement. So that will be ultimately lead to lack of bonding. Thank you. 
In this slide, you can see how uh, tracking will affect the bonding performance. If you can follow the picture of your top right, you can see if there are enough uh, tech code present in your pavement, it will be a, a good bonded pavement, uh, asphalt pavement. You can see uh, the, uh, the the micro strain that will, will be experienced uh, at the very bottom of asphalt layer uh, will be low. But if there are not enough tech code present in between, between different layers of your asphalt pavement or asphalt layers, your pavement will be unbonded, as you can see, and the micro strain that will be experienced by the bottom of your asphalt layer will be significantly higher than a bonded pavement. And this, and due to this uh, insufficient bonding, that will cause to pavement distress like slippage failure and fatigue cracking. Okay, so based on the discussion of the tracking and bonding issue, the problem statement of this research would be. The tech material that's picked up by the uh, construction vehicle tires are no longer available to bond your pavement layer. So, this poor quality tech can cause insufficient bonding that can cause to slippage failure and ultimately fatigue cracking. And that can occur very early in your pavement life if, if, there, uh, if there is not enough tech code between the layers of your pavement. So, trackless, uh, so your tech code needs to be trackless and it has to be has sufficient intellectual strength. And that is a prerequisite for a good pavement performance. Uh, so these are the two hypotheses that my research was built in. Uh, tracking of asphalt emulsion is primarily a function of rheological properties. Now I want to uh, spend a second, like what rheological properties are. So asphalt emulsion are basically a hot mixed asphalt binder uh, that are dissolved in water with the help of an oil or an emulsifier. So Rheological properties are those properties are like the viscoelastic materials like asphalt or tech coat, like how these viscoelastic material will perform or flow or in response to a stress or a, uh, or a load is applied. So these properties are called rheological properties. And so our, my hypothesis was that like the tracking can be predicted by the rheological properties of residual asphalt that, uh, it, that constitute the tech coat. And the, my second hypothesis was the interlayer shear strength of lab prepared samples. So this interlayer shear strength test, ISS test, is used to predict the bond strength of a tech core sample. So this uh, ISS is a function of surface texture rather than the properties of tech code residue. So this too was my main research hypothesis. And the objectives of uh, this study uh, at first uh, is obviously the tracking. Uh, define various factors that affect a tracking of tech code residue and to propose some method that can reduce tracking. And the second objective was to investigate some factors that affect the intellectual strength, uh, that means the bond strength of different tech code materials, and propose some method to see if we can estimate uh, bond strength correctly and if we can increase the bond strength. Uh, as I said, uh, this whole webinar is uh, broadly divided into two tasks. At first, uh, I will discuss uh, how I uh, uh, use a new uh, proposed uh, test that is called a loaded wheel test, LWT, uh, to evaluate the propensity of tech code. And in the second task, I will show uh, the how the intellectual strength of lab and pre prepared sample uh, helps to determine the contributing factor behind the bond strength or the intellectual strength test, that's ISS. So let's uh, move into the first part or highlight of this webinar, the tracking of asthma emulsion. Okay, at first, uh, this study was funded by WHRP, Wisconsin Higher Research Program, 1706, uh, by Wisconsin DOT. So I want to uh, acknowledge them in this slide. Um, so at first, this tracking study, this initial tracking study, started with two emulsions. Uh, one is the, a trackless emulsion, and the other one is the uh, CSS, that means cationic slow setting, and the 1H means it's polymer modified. So you can see, if you can see the second uh, column, uh, the base asphalt of these two emulsions are from two different spectrum. Uh, PG, one is PG88 and one is PG64. Now PG uh, means performance grade, uh, asphalt binder usually have one performance grade, like if it's a PG88 minus 24, uh, it means the first number 88 is the high number, 
That means the maximum temperature it can endure and perform well is 88 degrees Celsius. And if, it's, uh, uh, if there's a second number like minus 28, that means it can perform um, uh, in the lower temperature region until minus 28 within satisfactory performance. Like it will, it should perform uh, in uh, up to minus 28 if the lower spectrum region. So if you uh, see these two emulsion like trackless and CSS1H, these two cover two different end of spectrum. So I choose these two to see like how a, a softer uh, residue emulsion and how a stiffer residue emulsion will uh, behave in tracking. So, and this is the uh, new developed or proposed loaded wheel tracking test that I proposed based on a loaded wheel test to LWT. Now LWT or the uh, uh, equipment you're seeing in the picture uh, in your screen is a very uh, familiar equipment in the slurry seal industry. Now slurry seal is a very familiar uh, preventive maintenance technique. That's a mixture of fine aggregate and emulsion. So I use this device to, to see if we can quantify tracking using this test method. So what I did, you can see, uh, this is a, 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 a stone tile here. I apply uh, some amount of emulsion with a variable stream applicator, and I put it uh, in the machine. You can see some lead shot weight. You can control pressure of this tire using these different types of weight. There's a rubber tire, and the silicone rubber mat is used to minimize the mess due to the test. And after this setup, I ran this uh, uh, LWT for 10 times or 10 rotation. So after the test is done, I observed the tile, and there is a, a rubber tape that is wrapped around the, uh, this rubber tire. And after the test is done, if you can see, there is no tack coat in the uh, uh, tape, and, and there's no sign of that the uh, tack coat is being picked up from the stone tile, then we call it, uh, it is trackless in that temperature. On, on the other side, if you can see, there's significant amount of tracking on the uh, rubber tape, and there's a sign of that the tack coat is being picked up by the stone tile, uh, we can say that it is still tracking at that temperature. So this LWTT test is uh, it started at a fixed temperature, like a, from a 20 or 26 degrees Celsius, and I continued it in, in 6 degrees Celsius interval to find, uh, and I stopped until I find a trackless temperature. So this is um, how this uh, newly modified, uh, developed LWTT test was performed. And these are the uh, two main uh, like result or product you'll get from the LWTT test are the trackless temperature and the transition temperature. So trackless temperature, as I mentioned, this is the temperature you will not see any kind of tracking in the rubber tire or, or there, there will be no sign of attack is being, is being picked up from the stone tile. And the transition temperature, is a temperature six degrees Celsius higher than the trackless temperature. So it is a temperature that you will still see that some tracking will be observed, uh, but there will not be a significant amount of tracking. So this transition temperature was proposed to uh, place a factor of safety and to propose uh, like a temperature range like 46 to 52. In between that range, your track code will be trackless. So, uh, if you can follow this table, you can see I did this set at two temperatures. One was 15 psi, and other one was 100 psi, uh, with the different uh, varying lead weight. And as uh, we can see, the PG58, the trackless temperature was 46 degrees Celsius, and for the stiff residue emulsion, the trackless one, uh, that uh, the trackless temperature is 82 degrees Celsius. And for uh, for a greater pressure, 100 psi, that represents the truck tread pressure in the field, it gave a different trackless temperature. So the main takeaway of this slide will be pressure has an effect. So therefore, we selected 100 psi, so we can represent that. So this test can represent truck tread pressure in the field. And as expected, the trackless uh, res, uh, emulsion has a higher trackless temperature than a lower uh, stiff emulsion. That was. CSS1, the cationic flow setting one. Mm. Uh, then uh, I plotted this graph and I determined the stiffness of these two binder, that is G star by sine delta using a DSR, and I plotted the G star over sine delta with the temperature that I did the test. 
and you can see uh, there are two emulsion uh, the uh, blue circle represent the tractor's residue and the blue square uh, represent the css1 and uh, i i correlated this with the uh, awtt result and you can see both of these uh, uh, emulsion uh, uh, go trackless over a, a fixed at a fixed temperature and it has a fixed stiffness gesture over sine delta. So if you follow the trackless residue, you can see it becomes trackless at 70 degrees Celsius. And if you follow the uh, CSS1, it becomes trackless at 46 degrees Celsius temperature. So, so there is a so we can based on the stiffness or gesture over sine delta of this asphalt emulsion residue, we can propose a zone that is trackless. So if you can uh, ensure uh, that your stiffness or gesture over sine delta will cross a certain limit, your emulsion will be trackless. And, and there is a transition zone that I said, I propose it to make sure a factor, there is a factor of safety in this transition zone, your emulsion will be, there is a possibility of your emulsion will be still tracking, but there will be a very low probability of that. And, uh, and under this zone, the trackless zone, your emulsion will be tracked. So the bottom line of this slide is all binder can be trackless uh, by reducing temperature that can achieve a minimum value of gesture of side delta. If you can achieve a, a minimum gesture of side delta, your emulsion will be trackless at that temperature. Um, I extended my study uh, to see also if there are like effect of modifiers uh, in tracking and also if there are, uh, besides gesture over sign data, if there are effect of other rheological properties in tracking. So this slide is kind of busy, but I uh, place it here to show you the testing I have done in the tracking study. At first, the loaded wheel tracking test. And uh, as I said, I modified it from a STM D672. Uh, these are test condition, objectives, and the response measure. And I also did uh, the DSR test, dynamic shear humidity test, MSCR test, multiple stress creep and recovery test, and BYET test, binder yield energy test, all using a DSR. So I'll go to shortly what these tests do. Like DSR test, uh, it determines, as I said, the stiffness of, uh, of your emulsion residue. The MSCR test, multiple stress creep and recovery test that determine creep and viscoelastic properties of your emulsion residue and the BOET test, that's binder yield energy test, that determine the resistance of a certain type of binder against real type failure. So I did all this test alongside with the LWTT test, and these are the experimental work plan and, uh, for the, that I tested to determine if, if modifier has some effect on SL emulsion tracking. I used three neat binders, PD58 minus 28, PD64 minus 22, and a pen grade 35 minus 50. I use two modifiers, one is polymer and other is gelsonite. One single application rate was used, that is 0 0.04 gram per year square. Tracking temperature started at 40 degrees Celsius and I continued until 100 degrees Celsius to find the trackless temperature. Uh, curing temperature was 60 degrees Celsius in an environmental chamber and the substrate was stone tile. So these are the results uh, of a tracking test uh, with the uh, modified binder and also some neat binders. So interesting uh, factor to see here, um, uh, uh, I modified this binder with different type of polymer content and gelsonite content. You can see there are four combinations of PG58-28, there are four combinations of PG64-22, and there are two combinations of pen grade 35-50. And as I said, the interesting uh, thing to notice will be uh, the uh, results of this, oh, I'll come back to this later. And this is the experimental work plan for biological properties of tracking. Uh, as I said, uh, I use three neat binders, PG58 minus 28, PG64 minus 22, and PG82 minus 22. A tracking temperature for the neat binder was 28 to 82 at six degrees centigrade interval. The substrate type of stone tile. For DSTAR test, uh, I, uh, there's DSTAR over sine delta was determined at the six temperature, the MSCI testing temperature was five, and the BYET, that's binder yield energy test, I use six testing temperature. 
And this is just to recap of the loaded wheel tracking test. Uh, the test started low temperature. I increased temperature at 50 Celsius interval until tracking is observed. So the tracking behavior at first, let's discuss the tracking behavior of modified asphalt binder. So as I said, I prepared a four modified binder with a polymer zeosonite with PD50 minus 28, four with PD60 minus 22, and two combination with PenGuard 35 minus 50, all with polymer and zeosonite. And the interesting thing to notice here that the uh, for all PG58 minus 28 has a trackless temperature of 40, 40 to 46 degrees Celsius. Three of them has 46 and one has 40. And all the binder, all the modified binder that's modified with geosonite and polymer uh, and the neat binder was PG64 minus 22. The trackless temperature was between a range to 52 and 50, 58 degrees Celsius. And for the stiff binder, pen 35 minus 50, the trackless temperature range was 64 to 70. So the main takeaway of this slide is whatever the degree of modification is, like whatever the percentage you, diosonite you use or percentage of polymer you use, your trackless temperature will be in a fixed region. So binder modification doesn't affect the tracking of astral emulsion. You can use a modified uh, binder residue in your astral emulsion, but the determining factor of tracking will be your need binder. So you can see all these uh, uh, binder 50 minus 28, 64 minus 22, and pen 35 minus 50, you can make three distinct groups. And if your, uh, uh, your need binder will dictate your trackless temperature and transition temperature as well. Uh, this result will be more clear with this plot. You can see that plot I did, the gesture by over sine delta and temperature. You can see um, the, the three need binder, PG58 minus 28, has a, you can say, as a fixed region of, of tracking. And all, the, all the red bars you are seeing that denotes the trackless temperature of this uh, asphalt emulsion residue. You can see all PG58 minus 28, I dictate a fixed region. All the PG64 minus 22 modified binder has a fixed region. And uh, the two pen grade binder, two pen grade modified binder has a fixed region. Uh, uh, to make it uh, express it more clearly, I made a semi-log plot since the relationship between GSTR, the stiffness of binder and temperature is semi-log plot, uh, the GSTR by sine delta and temperature. You can see now all the trackless temperature will give you a very narrow region. And for this case, for all the modified binder use is 30 to 40 kilopascal. So bottom line of this uh, uh, tracking study is, as I said, uh, your tracking is not uh, affected by your binder modification. Your need binder uh, will tell you what, your need binder will dictate uh, what your trackless temperature will be. And for uh, this study, uh, the, uh, the band is 30 to 40 kilopascal. And if you can ensure a uh, uh, stiffness of 40 kilopascal, I can say your uh, asphalt emulsion will be trackless at that temperature. And some other biological properties on need binder. I use three need binder, PG58 minus 28, PG64 minus 22, and the stiff PG82 minus 22. Uh, these are the trackless temperature. Uh, as expected, uh, the stiff binder has a high trackless temperature, 52, and the softer binder has a lower trackless temperature, that is 34 degrees Celsius for this case. And for, from DSR testing, uh, I got log GSTR, log GSTR over sine delta and phase angle for all this need binder. And for, uh, if you can see this, for these three need binders, these are the trackless temperature, 34, 40, and 50. So all these uh, tests, DSR, MSTR, and BITE was done uh, at the trackless temperature. A GNR person recovery, these are products from MSTR test and maximum stress, strain at maximum stress. These are products from bite test, the binder yield energy test. I determined the average and percent of COV, the coefficient of variance, and then find out that at the trackless temperature, uh, log gesture and log gesture sine delta, phase angle, these are the has least variance. And from bite test, log yield energy has the least variance. So your the trackless behavior of your actual emulsion uh, can be determined by these properties, the geological properties. 
that comes from DSR test and BIET, that's binder yield energy test. This is the gesture over sine delta uh, versus temperature semi log plot, and this gives a, a narrow band of trackless uh, transition temperature to trackless temperature of 20 to 30 kilopascal. So what? So for this three need binder, we can say if we can, if the bind, uh, bind, if the emulsion residue stiffness is more than 30 kilopascal, it will uh, be trackless at the field. Uh, so the summary of this uh, uh, tracking study, so tracking uh, of emulsion residue can be estimated as a function of commonly measured re rheological parameter, and for this case, that is just over sine delta. And increased residue stiffness at the given temperature will give you greater resistance to tracking. The proposed LWTT, loaded wheel tracking test, can be a very reliable way of your subjective measurement of your tracking of asphalt emulsion. And Comparing all different rheological properties, GSTAR over sine delta is the best rheological property that can uh, predict tracking, and the value of 30 kilopascal can be placed as a minimum that will reduce tracking. And no other rheological properties will be needed to predict tracking. So now let's switch yet from tracking to bond strength side of the asphalt emulsion, evaluation of bond strength through interlayer shear strength ISS test. So in this part of the webinar, I'll discuss uh, some factors that affect the bond strength test. At first, I'll start with the sample preparation, how I prepare sample for this interlacial strength test, texture measurement, the how this ISS test work, the experimental work plan, uh, the laboratory testing I did, some statistical analysis I performed, the field validation, and then finally, uh, some discrepancies between lab and field samples. Uh, let's start with the sample preparation first. For interlayer shear strength test, uh, this is how I prepared samples in the lab. If you can see uh, the picture, the left side of the screen, uh, there's a bottom half of the uh, test sample that's compacted in a super paved jittery compactor. And then I press asphalt emulsion at the interface using a, a scale and a bristle brush. Uh, exact amount of asphalt emulsion of F applied to let it represent the application rate. And then there's a top half of the uh, asphalt mixture that compacted over this interface, also using a super jittery compactor. There are also some samples were made on the field course to uh, simulate uh, the field condition in the lab. You can see the, uh, in this picture at the right side of your screen, you can see this puck is uh, collected from field core. It was cut and trimmed. And then asphalt emulsion was applied at the interface, and that then the top half was compacted using a super paved jittery compactor. So this is how the two samples, uh, two, two types of sample was prepared for this uh, ISS test. Texture measurement, uh, two types of texture was used to uh, to see what's the effect of texture on the bond state of asphalt emulsion. One of the fine surface. That was 19.5 millimeter, and one was a stone matrix asphalt. If you can follow this picture on your top uh, bottom right of your screen, you can see this is a stone matrix asphalt surface, and this is a fine surface. You can see uh, there's a distinguished uh, difference between um, these two surfaces. Your stone matrix asphalt has a very coarse surface with high surface texture, and 19.5 uh, millimeter asphalt mix surface has a really fine surface. And I measured uh, the surface texture using two methods. One is a straightforward sand patch method, and another one is using a stationary laser profilometer. That's more as advanced technique to measure the surface texture. Um, this is the interlayer shear strength test procedure. And this is the uh, uh, a standard test, the H2TP114. Uh, a Louisiana interlayer shear strength uh, device, LISST device, was used to do all the shear strength tests. The, all the field course uh, of this study was used by Louisiana State University uh, in their lab, so I want to express my acknowledge to them. So this is uh, the LIST, is, uh, the Louisiana Interface Shear Strength Tester. A sample is placed here, you can, you can see, and the load is applied just at the interface where the asphalt emulsion are. So, that, so the sample just break at the interface, and it will give you uh, the bond stress of your asphalt, asphalt emulsion. This is the experimental work plan for bond strength. Uh, four emulsion type was used. 
CSS1, uh, the cationic flow setting, CSS1 HL, that's polymer modified, that's C CQS1, that's cationic quick setting, and the trackless one, that's NTQS. Two types of application rates, 0 0.02 gallon per year square and 0 0.05 gallon per year square was used to see the effect of application rate on bond strength. Three types of surface texture was used to quantify the effect of surface texture. One is a low uh, fine mix, as I show you a picture, one of the stone, stone mastic asphalt, and other one was a smooth surface. That's the cut face of fine mix, where mean uh, texture depth was zero. So the smooth was introduced to see, like, like what's the re what's the real effect of surface texture. And two test temperatures were used. One was 25 degrees Celsius, another was 46 degrees Celsius. A seven psi of, of confining pressure was used to hold the sample in the uh, Share testing device and three replicates to what tested for each combination. Uh, let's discuss the um, uh, with these two plots the effect of emulsion type and residual application rate on interlacial strength. The top figure uh, you can see all the uh, existing surface was a low texture, the fine mix, and the bottom figure all the samples were prepared uh, with the high texture stone mastic asphalt mix. Let's talk about the uh, effect of emulsion type. You can see the four emulsion, and the highest bond strength was gave by the trackless one, NTQS. NTQS. So a conclusion can be made that stiffer uh, base asphalt emulsion will give you high bond strength. And application rate, two application rate was used, as I said, 0 0.05 gallon per year square and 0 0.02 gallon per year square. And uh, the, if, if you can see the difference between these two were within the variability, so we can uh, say application rate doesn't have a much significant effect on interlacial strength. Uh, this is one of the main highlight of the surface uh, uh, of this uh, bond strength study, the surface texture. You can see all the yellow columns are stone matrix asphalt, the high texture, and all the uh, green columns are indicating fine texture. And uh, the top figure, uh, all the samples were made at 0 0.02 gram per year square application rate. And the bottom figure, all the samples were made with high application rate, that's 0 0.05 gram per year square. So whatever your application rate is, if uh, a sample has high texture, it will give you higher shear strength. You can see for all the cases, uh, the high texture give you much higher interlaced shear strength than the low texture. Even uh, one interesting factor to notice here, I made some sample even there is with no tech code at the interface. And and for, or for even with no tech condition, uh, if there is sufficient surface texture, there is a stone matrix as well, will give you higher interlacial strength than the fine texture. So surface texture is the most predominant factor in interlacial strength, and high surface texture will indicate higher bond strength. Effect of testing temperature. Uh, testing temperature has a significant effect on interlacial strength. I use two testing temperature. Uh, the, all the blue columns are representing 25 degrees Celsius, and all the red columns are representing 46 degrees Celsius. You can see lower, uh, lower higher temperature significantly reduces the interlacial strength uh, more than 40 percent or 50 percent. At 46 degrees Celsius, significantly low ISS can be. Uh, seen uh, either it's a fine bottom layer or it's a coarse or SMA bottom layer. So you have to uh, pay more attention uh, while applying tech or using tech code uh, in hot summer days as a temperature significantly reduces the ISS. A statistical analysis was also performed on these different factor and uh, the two main factor that was found, the surface texture as we already seen, and emulsion type also has an effect. And the r square adjusted factor from this testing analysis was 79%. So surface texture, emulsion type, application rate, and replicate effect, it can uh, explain 79% of this data variance uh, by these four variables, by, by these four factors. These four factors, if you consider these four factors, 79% of the data variance can be explained. I tried to validate the, my findings from the lab uh, with a small field variation study. So uh, 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 I, uh, six, six combination of cores were requested from mill surface, 
six combination were requested from new surface, and the other four combinations were requested from a, a coarser, new, a finer new surface. And we got 13 set of codes, and the field study, uh, we got uh, two uh, codes delivered with two emulsion, that is SS1H, that is slow setting emulsion, and a quick setting emulsion. So these two were the emulsion, those were used uh, at, at, at uh, active paving projects. At that time, it was a study done on Wisconsin. So we got only these two emulsion that the courts were delivered with. Mm. And I made a field versus lab comparison uh, in this interlayer shear strain. You can see in the y-axis are the interlayer shear strain. And in the x-axis, you can see uh, are all the uh, of 12 different field core combination, the male surface, 90 millimeter new surface, and 25 millimeter new surface. And these are the application rate, 0.025 done per year square and 0.05 done per year square. So the main takeaway from this slide is uh, the field cores always indicated lower than the lab samples that were replicated uh, to simulate the field condition. You can see for these uh, two new surfaces, 90 millimeter new surface and 25 millimeter new surfaces, yeah, so uh, the field value is significantly lower than the lab. For the mill surfaces, the field and lab values are slightly comparable, but even uh, two cases, field values were lower than the lab. And statistical analysis was also performed to uh, see uh, uh, the lab, to see the performance of lab versus field core with a t-test. Uh, we can see uh, uh, we have two application rate, but application rate doesn't have significant effect. Emulsion, we have two emulsion types. Emulsion type doesn't have a significant effect, uh, but difference between lab to feed sample has a significant effect. You can see nine out of 12 combinations, and there is significant effect between lab samples and the field samples. Also, uh, there were some issues encountered with the field codes. For some field codes, we have found that there are two interfaces. Uh, that means that there was an old layer of, of, of a, of a HMA layer with uh, old tag code, and some field codes has issues like dust in the interface. So this may also affect the field samples, and uh, this may be the reason why there are discrepancies between lab to field samples. So what are the possible causes of discrepancies uh, between this lab to field samples? So at first, uh, there may be compaction effort. In lab, uh, there are homogeneous condition. Uh, I used uh, superpaved jittery compactor, and the field, uh, the compaction if, uh, was done with the roller, so we cannot uh, com totally compare this to compaction effort. For the field core, the direction of travel or milling was not provided. The existing surface texture was not quantified, and there was some uh, uh, effect of coring that we'll discuss in the next slide, and surface cleanliness was not checked in the field. So these are the possible causes uh, that may cause discrepancies between the lab and field cores, and the effect of coding. So while we core uh, samples in the field, uh, uh, we try to be like keep the sample as undisturbed as possible. But I try to find out if uh, the samples are really undisturbed and they can really replicate uh, 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 the conditions um, that represent uh, uh, like an intact road in the field. So what I did, I made a uh, uh, three sample, I, uh, uh, three samples in the lab that were six inch diameter, and I took out a four inch diameter core use, using a four inch drill bit, and I t tested ISS for all the samples, and and you can see uh, for all the core samples, stasis one HL, the trackless core sample, and even if there is no tag code, the core samples showed uh, lower ISS uh, than the intact lab compactor sample. So there is a, a slight effect of coding you can see uh, when you're using a drill bit or a rig uh, while coding, uh, your samples may be disturbed due to coding or transportation and it may cause your bond strength to be lower than it should it it actually is. So summary of the bond strength finding, our uh, shear strength of lab prepared sample is primarily a function of surface texture and image residual stiffness. Uh, second one is testing temperature is found to be significantly affect into the shear strength. So high temperature will result in lower ISS, and poor relationship was observed uh, between the ISS uh, values measuring the lab and the field. 
So further development of ISS test method is required to simulate exact field condition and also the effect of cooling and, and compaction is to be taken into account. And conclusion uh, of this whole webinar, uh, so all emulsion uh, can show trackless behavior in the field if you can ensure a minimum value of just over sine delta and for this case, for this limited study, it is 30 kilopascal or greater. The newly proposed loaded wheel tracking test can be a very reliable way of direct measurement of tracking of asphalt emulsion. The interlayer shear strength or bond strength of asphalt emulsion is highly affected by surface texture and less by emulsion type or rate of application. And lab prepared sample cannot be used to estimate field shear strength as there is a significant gap between lab prepared sample and field code. So only field code should be used to make decision at this time. And some recommendation for future studies, uh, uh, as the new LWTT is a, uh, uh, all the tests I have done with loaded wheel tracking tests in the lab, so the field verification is needed. And further evaluation of ISS lab specimen preparation is needed to simulate the field condition. And more roughness level like mill surface or old surface should be, uh, needs to be included in the field study, as I have only two surfaces while I doing the field validation. And yeah, with that, uh, thank you everyone. I hope you found this subject interesting. I now want to uh, transfer this webinar to Jerry for question and answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Abu, very good. We're gonna begin our Q&A program here momentarily. I uh, just wanted to uh, introduce you to some up and, coming, up and coming webinars for us. And during that Q&A program, Abu will answer as many questions as possible. So on March uh, the 8th, um, we're going to hear from my good friend, Kevin Elliott. We also, as you recall, mix up the topics. So we heard a very intense pavement related topic today from Abu. Kevin is gonna speak uh, on communication roadblocks and how to break through them. He's very experienced in education as well as communication. I think you will all find that quite interesting. On April 26th, uh, we'll hear from Ken Hurley, and Ken is gonna speak about, again, another diverse topic, evaluating uh, the renewed nuclear explosive threat. And I think you'll find that uh, quite interesting. As a reminder, before we go on to uh, additional slides, if you're interested in registering for any of these webinars, you see the webinar address that's presented here, you can register. We also record all of our webinars. So if you have some colleagues that have missed today's program, or you thought about a program that we presented previously, then uh, they're available for you. And the connection location will be on that same web address that you see here. I'd like to begin the Q&A program right now. And bear with me, we do have a question. The first question comes from Jahara. And uh, the question is, does the tire thread have any intensifying effect? And it was noticed that the test apparatus that you showed, all the wheels were threadless. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Now, the device I use, the loaded wheel tester, uh, that doesn't have any thread. So that's a plain rubber tire. Uh, but the weight I use uh, with the lead shot, that uh, as a pressure as the actual wheel tire, but thread should an effect on tracking. Like uh, like a threaded tire should pick up more material uh, than a, a plain tire. So I think in future studies, it needs to take into consideration. Uh, like uh, if we can modify the LWTT test with a threaded tire, that will be a very interesting observation to be made. Okay, thank you. And the, the next question um, that we have comes from Chuck. And Chuck would like to know, can you speak a bit more about the loaded wheel tester? Yes, I think I, it will be helpful if I pull up the slide. So, so as I said, this is a, 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 a this loaded wheel tracking test. I modified it from LWT test. That's a loaded wheel tester that like uh, widely used in the study cell industry. Sterisil is a preventive maintenance technique uh, that makes uh, that a mixture of fine aggregate with asphalt emulsion that's placed on the road as a seal coat. And this device is used uh, 
to quantify like how much emulsion you can use in a slurry seal. So what they do, they place a slurry seal over a mat and then they run this uh, uh, like machine for I think 25 minutes. During this 25 minutes, uh, this device can replicate like one million uh, uh, replication. And after that, they observe the uh, uh, the slurry seal sample, and based on that, they uh, determine the what should be the limit of emulsion in the slurry seal. So. Uh, I modified this test uh, to be the loaded wheel tracking test so to see if it can quantify tracking like it quantified the uh, emulsion uh, percentage in slurry steel. Okay, thank you. So the the next question, and we have uh, have several questions that have come in. We'll address those questions as time permits. Next question is Amariji, and forgive me if I mispronounce some of the first names here. The question is, in the field, sometimes contractors apply a bit of water on truck tires, and have you measured that effect? Uh, it's like, do they apply truck tire to reduce tracking, or? Well, it's the effect of water uh, applied to the truck tire. Have you measured the effect of this in terms of the integrity of the tack code? Uh, in the uh, the LWT that these tests were done in the lab setting, uh, we can see. So in the field, uh, I have seen that the surface is pre-weighted with some water before applying the tack coat. And I have also seen uh, like some uh, in some sites they use oil around the tire to reduce tracking, but I haven't seen using water on tires. But I, again, these uh, LWTD tests are all done in the lab setting, so. So, so I didn't uh, like measure what will be the actual uh, effect of of like truck tires in those tires. So those things still need to be like considered. Okay, and another question. Um, uh, several good presentations and accolades to you, but the question asked uh, is that based on the study. A stiffer emulsion in the tack coat would have a lower propensity to tack, and I guess that's a a statement, but maybe a, a question to you. Would do you agree with that? I'll repeat it: that a stiffer emulsion in the tack coat would have a lower propensity to tack. Yes, I think is yeah we can say that because the stiffer emulsion and will have a, a like a higher trackless temperature. That means you can open your traffic early. Like you, you are, are, are paving in hot summer days, like, and if if your emulsion has a trackless temperature of 46 degrees Celsius, you can open your traffic uh, like after, like, uh, or you can uh, uh, allow the paver to pave early. You, you don't have to wait much. At the same time, it will give you higher bond strength. Okay, um, we have another question. And this question is from Karen. And the question is, why was the curing time for the tracking test an hour? And why wasn't it a longer time or a shorter time? Okay, so the curing of all the stone tile that applied with the tech loader was one hour because I found out that after it was properly set uh, within one hour. After one hour, uh, at the temperature, if I if I'm curing the stone tile at 60 degrees centigrade, after one hour it becomes 60 degrees, and it doesn't matter how long do you cure, it will be 60 degrees Celsius. So the bottom line is one hour is sufficient to achieve the test temperature that you want to do the LWT test. So I use one hour as the minimum curing temperature. Okay, they answered that well. Uh, we have a few more questions, and we've got about four or five minutes left. So the next question is from Bill, and Bill would like to know why only one application rate did you use in the tracking test? Okay, so we we did right. several we did several uh, like studies of bond strength to see if application rate has any effect, but we found like minimal effect. Like from our bond strength study, 0 0.02 gram per year squared and 0 0.05 gram per year squared yeah, like yielded almost same. Uh, kind of same number of bond strength. So since the effect of application rate was minimal, 
So we think uh, going with one application rate would be enough to see the effect of tracking. Okay, uh, a number of these questions are obviously related to the um, boundary conditions you use for the test. And so likewise is the next question. And the next question is from Jerry. And Jerry would like to know, why did you use six degree Celsius temperature intervals for the tracking test? It's a very interesting question. So six degree Celsius interval are, are used for like defining PG grids. Like uh, the asphalt binders are classified as PG58, PG64, PG70. So I use this 60 degree centigrade interval. So for that, the trackless temperature on the transition temperature are comes at 60 degree centigrade interval. So it will be uh, easier for users to select uh, asphalt emission grade residue but that will track them, like PG58, then PG64, then PG70. So six degrees of the interval was used to keep in line with the commercial grade PG grade available in the market. So that it's easier for the user and suppliers to select the temperature. The, the last question I think that we'll be able to accommodate is, and this is from Heidi, and Heidi would like to know, why did you use, again, a boundary condition or a variable for the test? Why did you use seven PSI confining pressure while you were doing the ISS test? Oh, this seven PSI confining pressure, this was uh, used to minimize, like, when an uh, 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 intellectual strength sample was placed in the device, um, there was some self-weight of the sample but that can affect uh, the intellectual strength. So, 7 PSI confining pressure was used so that just the minimum pressure that will help to keep the sample together in the in the shear testing jig so that it doesn't, so the self weight of the sample doesn't hamper the bond shear. Okay, very good. Those are all the questions that I have now. And as we usually do, we've asked Abu, and he's generously agreed to accommodate questions following the webinar. You see on this slide his email address at ARA. And within the next 24 hours, he'd be more than happy to try and assist you. Please frame your questions in a technical manner and avoid consulting type questions. I believe everybody understands what that statement means. I mentioned before, all of our presenters are ARA employees. And you'll note uh, that we use uh, not only a diverse range of topics, but a diverse range of tenure in their professional career. And Abu is one of our younger presenters. We do that for a variety of reasons. I'll give you an example. Mr. Elliott is a, is a senior uh, professional, and he'll be presenting. And we, we do this for professional development as well as technical development and communication, both internally and externally. Can I have the next slide, please? Just two slides left. Uh, so we want to thank you once again on behalf of ARA for joining today's program. Today's presentation, as I mentioned before, is recorded and we'll be providing a link that will be made available at ARA Webinar Wednesday website, which I showed you uh, earlier today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know. Also, if you attended the entire program today, you'll be uh, eligible for one PDH uh, hour and you receive a certificate as well as a PDF copy of today's presentation and allow us about three weeks to get you your certificate. If you have any questions, reach out to us at the email address that you see us here. We're more than interested in hearing your feedback. Next slide, please. And of course, the final slide. Uh, ARA is a growing program. We're about 1,730, 40 people. I lose count occasionally. We have about 50 offices across the continental U.S. and Canada. And we're always interested in looking at new great people to join our team. So if you're interested in the current employment opportunities at our transportation and infrastructure offices, please send us a brief resume and your contact information at the address that you see here. Uh, I want to thank you once again on behalf of Abu, myself, and the entire ARA family. You all have a blessed day, and thank you for joining. We hope to see you next month.